Scotland's Friday Forum, Oregon's public, uh, premier public affairs forum. I'm Jim Zarin, president of City Club, and I welcome you all, those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB FM, or KBPS AM radio, or watching on cable television. Thank you all for joining us for this week's Friday Forum on this, the 16th of January, 2009. Today we'll hear from a panel of experts who will discuss innovative solutions to governmental budget crises, both at home and abroad. But before we begin our program, I have a few announcements. First, in consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, I ask everyone in the room who has not already done so to please turn off your cell phones or any other devices that could make noise. We are pleased to acknowledge our four Friday Forum uh, quarterly corporate sponsors without whose generous financial support these time-honored City Club Friday Forum luncheons would not be possible. Our four corporate sponsors this quarter are Girding Edlin Development Company, Pacific Power, The Standard, and UBS. We thank all of our corporate sponsors for their support. We invite all of you to join the club's agri committee for their two upcoming events, one on human trafficking on January 22nd, and the other on the role of the media in our local community on January 28th. For more information about either of these events, please go to the club's website or call the club's office. Now in January, uh, we also welcome the return of the City Club's book club, Citizen Read, with the book Kafka Comes to America by Portland Federal Public Defender Stephen Wax. And we're pleased to announce right here today that Stephen Wax will be speaking and taking questions at the book discussion of Agora, which will be on January 29th, 28th at City Club Commons. Now, Cynthia Townsend, Cynthia, stand up, there we are, uh, who is selling discounted copies of his books at the back of the room, deserves kudos for her work on this project. Thank you, Cynthia. Another upcoming Friday Forum uh, on January 23rd, uh, Willamette University President Lee Pelton will address the intersection and significance of race in politics in today's America. And then a week later on January 30th, Multnomah County Chair Ted Wheeler will offer, offer his State of the County address. We hope you join us for these upcoming forums. And now to today's program. When Oregon Senate President Peter Courtney recently referred to the state's budget situation as mis mission impossible budget, you know that the economic outlook in state government in Oregon is bleak. Indeed, there is a predicted gap between state revenues and the cost of providing state services in Oregon of more than a billion dollars for the upcoming biennium, a projection, by the way, that some are saying could double or triple by the time we're through the session. As a result, Oregon's governor, Ted Kulongoski, is seeking to increase taxes and fees to fund areas such as transportation, and at the same time, his budget sets out cuts to social programs, including care to the elderly and the disabled. Now, local governments in Oregon face similar financial challenges, some arguably even worse, as we may hear from Multnomah County Board uh, Chair Ted Wheeler at the end of the month. Of course, governments in Oregon are not alone in confronting severe budget crises, nor are our governments the first to do so. So today, City Club welcomes three panelists who will explore with us how other governments, both in the United States and in other countries, have dealt with tax and spending crises and ways we might address these issues differently in Oregon. First, we welcome Richard Burke, who will provide an overview of foreign and domestic responses to historic budget crises. Rich Burke is a co-founder of the New Budget Coalition and is a two-time winner of the Cascade Policy Institute's Better Government Competition. Rich currently works as the Director of Grassroots Development for Americans for Prosperity in Oregon, based in Beaverton. Rich also is serving his third term as elected commissioner for the Tualatin Valley Water District and is president of that commission. He served six years as the Libertarian Party of Oregon's Executive Director was the state party state chair and uh, held a seat on the Libertarian National Committee. He's a graduate of Portland State University. Next, we will hear from Randall Pazdina, who will discuss international tax structures and their economic consequences, as well as where U.S. Tax, po tax policies fit on the global stage. Randy Pazdina is the managing director of the consulting firm Eco Northwest and heads that firm's Portland office. Before joining Eco Northwest in 1991, 
Randy was a vice president at the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco and taught economics and finance at the University of California at both their Irvine and, and, and Berkeley campuses. Widely recognized practitioner in applied economics, econometrics, and banking and securities markets, Randy has uh, written over 50 published books and papers on these topics. Our third and final panelist will be former State Representative Lane Shetterly, who is now serving as the chair of the Oregon Task Force on Revenue Restructuring. Lane will report on the findings of that task force and its most relevant and immediate recommendations. Now an active partner again in his law firm Shetterly, Eirich, and Ozias in Dallas, Oregon. From 2004 to 2007, Lane Shetterly was the director of the Oregon Department of Lands Conservation and Development after serving seven years in the Oregon legislature. Now before, before turning the podium over to the panel, and as what is now becoming a city cup tradition, I want to share a few personal items of interest regarding our three speakers. First, Rich Burke, having become tired of his car stereo being stolen four times in two years, has installed in his 2000 Chevy Prism an in-dash eight-track tape player on the theory that no one would want to steal that. <laughs> also, Rich Burke admits to being a self-described Star Trek nut, his own term, and to prove it, he says that he has a Captain Kirk outfit that he actually wears to Halloween costume parties. As to Randy Posdina, when in college at Dartmouth, he was the designated driver and mechanic for his fraternity's 1927 American La France hook and ladder fire truck. And I, I, I'm told that one of his fraternity brothers uh, wrote this, a screenplay to Animal House, and there was a vehicle driving around terrorizing people that may have suggested something having to do with the fire truck he used to drive at Dartmouth. Also, as a teenager, <laughs> As part of the research that led to the development of the birth control pill, Randy Posdino once had a job sucking fluid out of rabbits' eyes. <laughs> now, on a less bizarre side, Lane Shetterly's personal claims to fame, including having completed four marathons, having performed with the Portland Opera Chorus at Carnegie Hall, but after sponsoring a bill relating to the establishment of pet trusts while a member of the legislature, he was featured in Cat Fancy Magazine. So with credentials like these, how would, can we go wrong with having a panel like this address any subject, including our topic of today on alternative government approaches to budget, budget crises in economic downtimes? So to get us started, please welcome Rich Burke. After Rich has completed his remarks, he will be followed by Randy Posdina and then Lane Shetterly. Rich? Good afternoon. I'd like to begin by thanking the City Club for this fine invitation. This is the first time I've had the privilege of addressing this group. And would like to uh, thank one of your members in particular. I don't see her here today, Joan Montague. I don't know if she's here today. But she was my social studies teacher in seventh grade at Waluga Junior High School. And it is largely because of her that I was inspired to get involved in public service. And so I have a tremendous amount of debt to this teacher and uh, appreciate the fact that she is a member of this club. One of the things that wasn't mentioned in my bio was that I was a legislative assistant for a couple of terms down in the legislature. And what I learned there is that when there's a financial crunch, and this was especially true during the five special sessions, budgetary reform, the topic of budgetary reform is probably one of the least appealing or politically sexy topics that there is. It's boring to many, it seldom makes headlines. It's sometimes difficult to understand, you can't reduce it to a sound bite, it requires a lot of explanation. There's little or no immediate political benefit to legislators who are trying to fight with it because you know you have to take on a culture of, of uh, organization that's used to doing things a certain way and they have to change it makes people mad sometimes. And so um, telling the legislature that it needs to change the way it budgets its money is somewhat akin to telling children to eat their vegetables. They, it gets pushed around the plate and uh, it doesn't always get done. There are exceptions to this. I'll outline some of those, those excellent exceptions later on in my speech. But there's a dynamic that must be fought with respect to budget reform. Every time I see an organization come to the legislature and say, look, we know we're in a crunch, we know we're looking at revenue options, but we've got to change the way we spend our money, 
the response is almost invariably, you know, you're right. We agree with you. But we don't have the time in this legislative session to go through that. This is something that, that we should do in the interim. Right now, we've just got to deal with the triage today. Well, the triage is dealt with, the interim comes, and nothing happens. And uh, it's, it's very tough. An example comes in, in this book. I'd like to recommend to everyone, uh, Tom Cox recommended it to me, Work the System. It was about a guy in Bend who had a business, and he was always doing things ad hoc, always in crisis mode, making things up on the fly. And he knew that he had to take the time to set processes down, set policies, but he kept saying, I just don't have the time right now, and it never got done. Eventually, he actually bit the bullet, did it. Now he makes a lot of money and uh, spends less time, there's less chaos. If the legislature takes the example from this book, then there'll be more money for the services that it provides. There'll be less chaos, more predictability. There'll be more confidence in government because there'll be more services provided for less money. So in the current economy, the need for efficiency is incredibly acute. This isn't the worst time to take on the topic of budget reform. It is the best time. It is a better time than taxes. Even with respect to President Obama, or President-elect Obama, he has pointed out that we need middle class tax cuts. And he has also said that we have to defer repeal of the Bush tax cuts. He knows that raising these taxes is difficult, um, will be difficult and create difficulties for the creation of wealth needed to solve our economic problem. He has in fact gone and, and come up with a whole group of people that's designed to find inefficiencies in government and fix them, even as he tries to spend money in other areas. Also, deficit spending must be minimized. By some accounts, our federal government is in debt by $72 trillion for uh, um, unfunded liabilities over the next 50 years. $72 trillion. To give you an idea of how much that is, before the property crash, all of the homes in the United States were worth a total of $21 trillion. That's how much in debt we are if you take Medicare, Social Security, the federal debt, all of these issues. And that's before the collapse and before the bailouts. And our state is now talking about borrowing money to do spending. So, you know, the jury on Keynesian economics is out. Did Roosevelt pull us out or was it World War II? Nixon wasn't able to do it. Kennedy had trouble doing it. So if we're not going to borrow money or if we're going to try to minimize the amount of money we borrow, and we see that taxes, at least in the short term, retard the creation of wealth that we need to come out of this recession, what's left? Budgetary reform. Now, budgetary reform is not, to me, taking a meat cleaver and chopping it up. I'm a libertarian. A lot of you have, have well, some of you have met me before. And libertarians like to, to say, well, let's cut this program. Let's cut that program. I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm not going to talk about where we should or should not spend money. What I'm going to be talking about is how we're going to spend money and how we bring everybody along. The first thing... <clears throat> is that we need to set priorities. I'll talk about that in a moment. But key to the whole process is that we need to change the culture in Salem so that what we are paying for is outcomes, not just action, activity. If you go to a budget hearing, you'll hear agencies talk about how many full-time employees, FT, FTEs there are, what the current um, service level amount of funding is. What we need to do is start funding outcomes. What that means in the case of a city government, for example, is how much does it cost to fix a pothole? You know, does it cost $100, $1,000? A lot of places don't know. How much does it cost to put up a speeding sign on a state highway? Do we know? A lot of these things we don't. I, I served um, in the legislature as a legislative aide, and, and uh, my boss, Senator Gary George, was head of the um, transportation committee when I served. And a lot of these things we just didn't know. We were funding action, we weren't funding outcomes. We could use more performance audits. You know, we have audits of our state agencies and the money goes where it's supposed to go. But how much bang are we getting for our buck? This is what a performance audit can tell us. We can get more with less. One thing we can do is to go through the Oregon State Constitution 
and take a look at what does the Constitution actually require the government to do. Fund those things first. Whatever it is, you know, system of common schools, education, if the correct level is $10 billion or $7 billion or $15 billion, whatever the number is, fund it first. Public safety, education, fund the constitutional functions of government first, then function what is, what is extra, the services that government feels is important to provide. Too often in our legislative sessions, we do just the reverse. We pay for a lot of the things that are not explicitly in the Constitution, and then we find that the money is spent and we still haven't passed a school budget yet. We've got that completely backward, and that's what needs to change. And it may be um, surprising to hear a libertarian say this, but I think we've beaten up on our public employees for way too long. I think the discussion of partisanship that uh, you have taken on before the beginning of this program is one of the um, root causes of the demonization of public employees. Every public employee that I've ever met is a good person who wants to do a good job, who wants to provide value and service. And, and even with respect to the agencies, that's true. Now, we can argue whether government should be doing this or should not be doing that, but if you talk to the actual employee, they want to do a good job and they want to provide um, a service. So they have to be a part of the process. And what's more, we have to empower our public employees to say, hey, I know how to do it better. I know how to do it faster. I had a brief job in the, in the early 90s at Clackamas County Community Corrections, um, an excellent agency, but a lot of the line workers, they knew how to fix things. And it was just too difficult to implement um, some of those changes. So let me start with a few examples of what I'm talking about. Some of you may have read this book or may have heard about it, but Mayor Stephen Goldsmith wrote a book called The 20, 21st Century City. He was elected, served a couple of terms as the mayor of Indianapolis, and what he did is hit upon the idea of marketization, not privatization. Privatization is when you take a government function and farm it out to the business. You know, not surprisingly, public employee unions don't like this. It creates a lot of problem, kicks in that partisanship we're talking about, and too often, not a lot gets done. Marketization is when they can bid on it too. You say, we've got, we've got to fix our, our car pool, we've got to fix our motor pool, our Department of Transportation. We're going to put it out to bid. We're going to put out services to bid. And the public sector can bid too. And what we find is when they are placed in that situation, the public employee unions and the employees pool their knowledge, they decide how they can do it better, how they can do it cheaper, without firing employees, they put out a bid, and frequently they win it. In Indianapolis, SEIU was key, and they won many of the contracts. What was the result? Okay, with the water treatment department, sewer bills decreased 33%. The cost of fixing potholes decreased 25%. Management costs were down 44%. They saved a total of $65 million in five years, and they reduced the number of employees by attrition. And this was all engineered by a public employee union who had to bid on this contract. This also happened in Minneapolis, following uh, the Indianapolis model. Similar results, again, the SEIU was key in all of this. Example right here in Oregon, SAFE. They've kept rates low. There are some who believe it should be private, should be public. But however it would exist in the future or exist today, they have a practice of using after-action reports after everything they do. They get together and they talk about after-action reports. What did we do? What went right? What went wrong? How could we do it better? And the way they are managed has a lot to do with, they, with the fact that they have some of the lowest rates in the country and is one of the bright spots in the future of Oregon's economy. The Department of Human Services contracted with Kaufman Global LLC to assess DHS finances, practices, and efficiencies. The result, a contract amount, cost them $688,000. After one year, it saved them $653,000 and the five-year projected savings is $5.2 million. Um, another example, South Dakota Department of Transportation. 
they literally just went to the basic functions that they had and said, how much does it cost to lay a lane mile of road? What does it cost to put up a sign? Everything, and they came down and they packaged it as units. And they worked with their staff to reduce the cost of providing these units. And so instead of looking for money for FTEs, they were looking for money for projects. And what they did was amazing. They had a first time savings of 20 to 30%, and ongoing savings of $2 million per year. They developed an equipment um, budget, uh, excuse me, equipment maintenance budget, which cut costs by $4 million a year by simply changing the way that they look at, at their budgeting process. We've all heard about um, New Zealand. New Zealand is similar to Oregon in, in many ways, same number of lane miles, similar climate, similar population. Um, they have farmed out a lot of, they've contracted out a lot of their um, Department of Transportation. They've had dramatic savings. Um, I'm looking for my notes here. Uh, Australia, same thing. We have to look at what is the objective of providing a government service. Why do we do it? You know, do we do it to create activity? Do we do it to create jobs? Or do we do it to provide value to people who live in Oregon and in the United States, to provide a service? I think it's to provide a service. Even advocates of public agencies say, we're serving this many people, we could serve this many people, if only we did this. You know, the objective is to provide these services. Any other objective which undercuts this does not serve our people well. So in this economic environment, we're looking at potentially a $2 billion hole in the Oregon state budget. If taxes will retard the creation of wealth, if borrowing just mortgages our children's future, we have got to take a more serious look at budgetary reform. I want to, uh, before I close, put it to you another way. Sustainability. At the Tualatin Valley Water District, sustainability is very important to us. We just remodeled our headquarters office. We qualified for silver lead certification. Um, we recycle almost everything we use. We even have a battery recycling program for the employees who don't want to just throw their batteries away. We have biodiesel fleet. We do all of these things. And I know that the City Club values sustainability too. I admire the way the City Club has talked about sustainability in our environment, forest, recycling. Many of the positions that it has taken in the past, many of the speakers it has hosted in the past, have favored the idea of sustainability. But we usually only think of sustainability in terms of the ecology. That's what's hot right now. I will submit to you that we need to start thinking about sustainability in our budgets. And we need to think about it the same way we think about sustainability in our ecology. I get in trouble with um, my libertarian and some of my conservative colleagues at times when I say, look, if we can, if in government we can provide more widgets for less money, who's not going to do it? You know, even liberals hate waste. I, I even wanted to make a bumper sticker saying, even liberals hate waste. And if we are doing something in a certain way within our budgetary process, and we could be doing it better, then the difference is waste. And the fact that we have not instituted budgetary reform represents gobs and gobs of waste. And it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat or a Green or a Libertarian, it doesn't matter if we're, not, if we're not doing our best to make ourselves more efficient all the time with the assistance of citizens and public employee unions and everybody else, then we're simply wasting money. And in this climate, we cannot waste money. So I invite the City Club to take an aggressive stance in support of sustainable budgets in the legislature and creating sustainability through budget reform processes and to ask that they do it now it is a prerequisite to raising taxes. It is a prerequisite to borrowing money. And, you know, on, on this point, I think, especially with regard to waste, 
doesn't matter what party you are, we can all t come together. I'm going to try to, to uh, do this in my work, and I hope that I get to work with as many of you as possible. Thank you very much. First, I want to thank Jim for raising some of the more embarrassing events of my uh, background for you. Uh, I do want to point out, however, though, uh, Animal House was written about Dartmouth fraternities by a Dartmouth graduate, Chris Miller. It was filmed at the University of Oregon. Uh, uh, we economists are not sexy. We, God knows we've tried to change that. Uh, we printed a bumper sticker that said economists do it on demand, you know, and <laughs> nobody bought it. Uh, so I'm here today to confirm that preconception about economists uh, because I'm going to talk about tax rates. Nothing sexier than tax rates. Uh, before, uh, in particular, I've been asked to, com to talk about how we compare internationally regarding the taxation of personal and corporate income. Uh, before I put you completely to sleep with a bunch of numbers, first I just want to get a couple of terms out there that I want you to focus on, if you don't mind. Uh, one is the distinction between tax rates and the revenues they raise. Uh, we often hear policymakers and, and others say, I want to raise taxes on this group or that group or lower taxes on this group or that group. And what do they mean? Do they plan to raise tax rates, or are they hoping that tax revenues will be collected, higher tax revenues will be collected from that group? The distinction is not a moot one because raising marginal tax rates generally results in a reduction in revenues, not an increase. Now, the seemingly ironic or contradictory result is because Lower tax rates tend to encourage us to work harder on the margin, invest more on the margin, take more risk on the margin, and so forth, and thus increase the income that is subject to tax. And so the lower rate applied to a bigger pie, you end up with more revenue. Uh, some quick examples of this out of, our, out of our history. Herbert Hoover learned this the hard way, poor guy, I mean, he was, he was sort of the, well, not quite the George Bush of his day, but uh, had, had the good luck of presiding over uh, the start of the Great Depression. He raised high income tax, he, uh, the income tax rate that was applied in those days only to people with very high incomes from 21 to 63% in 1932 to balance the budget. Not only did revenues from the affected taxpayers fall 80%, but it gave a kick downward to the economy at a time when it didn't need it. We don't know how Herbert missed Calvin Coolidge's efforts in 1926 when he cut tax rates from 73 to 21% and revenues increased 61%. I think the only lesson here is that politicians take some time to learn about tax rates at least. When JFK cut the top tax rate from 91% to 70 in 1965, revenues grew by 62%. The Reagan tax cuts in the early 1980s increased revenues by 99%. The Bush tax cuts, although the Bush tax cuts are much vilified, did produce a 20% increase in revenue between 2004 and 2006, even after adjusting for inflation. Now, even our former communist friends have caught on. In 2001, a lot of people don't know much about what goes on in tax policy, and communist, let alone former communist countries. But in 2001, Vladimir Putin cut the top tax rate in Russia from 30% to 13%, and revenues grew by 75% in 2004. So that's history, but now let me take you through sort of a comparison of how we look versus the people that we have to compete with every day, our businesses have to compete with, you have to compete with for jobs and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to turn to comparisons and trends in the from the international perspective. First, contrary to everything you've heard, and this is why, again, we're not sexy, liked, or invited even out for dinner. 
we have the most progressive personal income tax in the world and the highest effective taxation of the well-to-do. Now, this is not what you hear, and I don't blame you if you don't believe me. Uh, but it's not my opinions, but the finding of the o recent OECD study of its member states, OECD Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, are the big industrial well-doing, you know, doing well countries that uh, constitute uh, the world economy. It, uh, they published a paper in 2008. And here's, here's the news on that. Take the top 10% of American households by income. They pay the highest share of their incomes in tax of all of the 30 richest OECD countries. Now, I know this is a bunch of statistics just kind of coming at you, but the 10% of Americans pay 45% of all income taxes paid in the United States. True, they earn 33% of all income, but the ratio of taxes to income is 1.35 for those of you who uh, are taking notes, which I think is almost no one. Uh, now this is almost 50% more progressive than Switzerland, who's, who happens, which country that happens to be at the opposite end of the scale, and more progressive even than Sweden, where I lived for two years, which was sort of the Taxachusetts of the world scene uh, when I lived there. Britain, the Netherlands, and every, everybody else in this top 30 OECD countries. Indeed, by any measure of tax equality, and there are more complex ones called the Gini coefficient and uh, things that only economists love to construct, we have the most progressive, effective, effective personal tax structure in the civilized world. Now, in terms of international trends in household income taxation, we're behind the eight ball here a bit, too. There is a clear trend because of the effect of cutting tax rates on income, the positive effect of cutting tax on, on revenue and income, there is a clear worldwide trend toward cutting the highest income tax rates. We're talking about raising them or ret excuse me, returning them to their former higher levels. Uh, according to a KPMG study published last year, KPMG is a big international accounting and advisory firm, 33 industrialized nations lowered their highest personal income tax rates. And many, this is kind of the real surprise, have taken the next logical step to embracing flat rate, one rate taxation. Hong Kong started this trend in 1947, taxing and still does all personal income at, at the flat rate of 16%. Uh, in the last five years or so, Australia, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and 20 other advanced economies have cut their top personal tax rates. On the flat rate side of things, Singapore moved to a flat rate of 20%. Bulgaria abandoned its top rate of 29, adopted a 10% flat rate. Estonia, 26%, adopting a 21% flat rate. Slovak Republic, 28% to a 19% flat rate. Romania, 40 to a flat rate of 16%, blah, blah, blah. Now, why are all these ex-commie countries doing this? They've realized that they need revenue. They have very poor ability to collect and enforce a tax system. And the lower the rate, not only do they stimulate their economies, but they stimulate the collectivity, the ability collect, collectability. Of, of tax revenues. Um, and by the way, countries with lower tax rates are not suffering lower revenues. Hong Kong's tax revenues from personal income as a share of GDP is almost identical to ours, even though our highest tax rate is more than double their flat rate. Let me now quickly turn to business taxation. And by these, these reports, I'll be glad to give anyone a reference to these reports. Uh, they came out during the campaign, so of course, they were not read by anybody. Um, I did because, you know, I have to read this stuff. Let me turn now to business taxation. First, I want to say, say something that a few people like to hear, that it makes no sense to tax corporate income. Uh, that's anathema in some circles, and if I go to a cocktail party and say that, pretty soon I'm sitting at the punch bowl just sipping the punch all by myself. 
And the reason is that these profits are taxed ultimately when households receive them in the form of dividends or capital gains. Hence, corporate taxation is implicitly double taxation and a discouragement or a deterrent to attracting and retaining businesses. Uh, this state could, <laughs> could stimulate its economy tremendously by eliminating its corporate tax rate. And revenues, ironically, to the state would likely rise. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not advising, uh, my, my political skills, uh, Bob Stacy knows how good my political skills are, uh, you know, like a bull in a china shop, but uh, uh, it is definitely the case that the taxation of corporate income worldwide is becoming a thing that you shouldn't do. KPMG has a, uh, an additional report, not only in the personal one, but on business taxation, and it finds us again standing out, and not in a good way. We have the second highest tax rate on business profits of the 106 countries in the world that publish data. Who's the highest? Our friends in Japan, who have been, as you know, suffering through a 15-year long recession. By comparison, everyone else is sharply lowering the rates and eating our lunch. I have graphs, but this is not a graphical presentation. Uh, if I showed them to you, you'd be astonished. What has happened to corporate tax rates in the EU plummeted. They are now 23%. Half of the 40% state plus federal tax rate that corporations pay in the US on the margin. In quirky Switzerland, where the, the total rate of taxation of corporations varies by canton, which must be kind of fun. You have to learn Italian if you want to enjoy the lowest tax rates. Uh, the, range, the rate of marginal taxation of corporations ranges from a mere 5% to a maximum of 24%. And I could name the, con uh, the con cantons for you if I could pronounce them. Even in the developing nations of the Asian Pacific area, the average tax rate is only 28%. And this is a region where actually you'd expect business taxation to be high, and it is in China, for example, because uh, you kind of have to tax corporations because it's so hard to find the households. It's like the old days in Italy, you know. You'd knock on the door and there'd be no one there uh, to uh, hand a tax return to. Uh, so the point here is that by comparison, we're, we've got a high tax, very high tax rate, highest, second highest in the world, while the rest of the world is dropping their marginal tax rates and we wonder why our businesses are moving overseas. I'm not saying it's the only factor, but you, you've got to start thinking about this. So the bottom line here, just to, to close, is that the best thing that we could do for our economic health to recover from quickly from the recession, to improve our trade balance, and ironically, to support public sector revenues, would be to lower our tax rates not raise them. Unfortunately, US politics today seems more intent on stoking kind of income class or various kinds of divisions and denigrating business and public. Um, you know, the campaigns have been full of l l language about corporate fat cats raising tax rates on households with incomes over some magical level of there where it becomes obscene and so forth. I've never seen a fat cat, by the way, that didn't live in a household that was pretty fat itself. So it, it is true that we have some obscenely high levels of compensation in American corporate boardrooms, but I'm not so sure that I'm not getting at least some of that. So in this era of uh, what I like to call the reinvigoration of Carterite populism, the real, acts, the real facts about taxes and their effect, to quote a very famous source, constitute an inconvenient truth. And uh, on that uh, ambiguous conclusion, I will thank you for your kind attention. I want to uh, thank the uh, City Club for inviting me to be on this uh, panel as well. I think for me it's a return trip uh, to speak to the City Club uh, and it's a pleasure to be here and to uh, see so many 
Friends, uh, my role here today is to address a little bit closer to home uh, some of the current happenings, developments of the Task Force on Comprehensive Revenue Restructuring that I chaired over the past interim, and uh, just a very brief uh, picture of uh, at least one of our major short-term recommendations to the legislature. Uh, the time that we have doesn't allow me to, to present all of the findings and all the recommendations of the task force, but at the end I'll give you uh, a link to the uh, Legislative Revenue website where you can see the full report. The uh, task force on comprehensive revenue restructuring was created in 2007. Uh, and it was a large affair. Uh, the membership was 30, including four senators, uh, four representatives, uh, and the other members appointed by the, uh, the governor. Uh, that's a big group to bring together to talk about tax uh, uh, structure uh, in Oregon, uh, and it was a challenge, but I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, I think we have a, an excellent product to bring to the legislature uh, in this session. I want to stress the diversity in the task force, uh, not only in terms of geography, representing all parts of the state, uh, but also it, rep it, was, uh, it included a wide range of uh, ideology and political persuasions uh, from uh, Democrat to Republican, Libertarian, liberal, conservative, business, labor, uh, and taxpayer groups, uh, education groups, all of those represented on the diverse uh, uh, membership of this uh, uh, task force we met beginning in November of 2007 until this month. We finished uh, just uh, last, a week before last. Uh, most of the meetings in Salem, but we also were careful to meet around the state in Medford, Newport, Pendleton, Eugene, and Redmond to make sure that we were participating uh, with citizens around the state as well. Uh, we studied uh, the state uh, and local revenue systems. That was an express charge of the legislation that created the task force to look not only at the state revenue system, but also the local, although my remarks this morning are really, or this afternoon are really going to focus uh, on the state again, just because of the, the, the uh, limitation in time. And just uh, as a nod to your uh, report that you adopted today on partisanship, I want to say at the beginning that the uh, report and recommendations of the task force, that 30 member task force represents a consensus uh, of the membership of the task force. Uh, it was an excellent process, uh, and uh, at the end, uh, I can say that uh, the report and recommendations do indeed represent a consensus of the 30 members uh, of that task force. One of the key findings that we made among several about our state and local revenue systems is not news, uh, but it's backed up by new data, uh, new information in the report. Uh, it's a critical one, even though it's not new, and that is that our state revenue system dominated by the personal income tax, as it is, is highly volatile, which challenges the state's ability to maintain a consistent level of public services and programs and an adequate level of services during economic downturns. When we talk about the state revenue system and the state general fund, it's important to understand what that general fund supports. 95% of the state general fund is devoted to education, public safety, and human services. That other 5% of the budget supports things like the legislature, the governor's office, uh, and a smattering of other uh, much smaller general fund programs. But we're talking now 95% of what the state funds, education, public safety, and human services. So it's critical that we understand the function of our state general fund and the necessity uh, that that general fund maintain a consistent level of programs and services in those critical areas. The personal income tax in Oregon accounts for 86% of the state general fund revenue. 7% comes from the corporate income tax. So between those two, that's 93% of our state general fund. That is the highest rate of dependence on the income tax of any state in the nation, and it's the highest rate of dependence on any single revenue source of any state in the nation. The income tax is highly elastic, meaning that it grows rapidly during periods of economic growth and declines just as dramatically during economic downturns. We think of it as our state budget riding on a roller coaster. A recent example was 2001 to 2003 during the recession. That was a national recession of all states. The average decline in revenue was 5.6% during that period. In Oregon, our, but our revenues declined 20.3%. Outside of Alaska, which has a completely different revenue structure, we were the worst state in the nation in terms of the impact of, uh, of that recession on our general fund revenues. 
We recovered following that, but we are at the precipice now, and in fact falling into uh, the, new, the current recession, the national recession. We understand now that we're about 142 million short for the current biennium. That number could very well grow before the end of the biennium at the end of June. And we're about $1.4 billion short for the coming biennium in maintaining what is basically an essential budget level current services. And again, I think as you heard before, that number is likely to grow. So we're seeing it now, even today, uh, that effect of the boom and bust cycle in our general fund. That's not good uh, for government. When the downturn occurs, we don't have fewer kids to educate in our schools. We don't have fewer prisoners to maintain in our prisons. We don't have fewer people uh, requesting and needing public services. In fact, it's countercyclical. We usually have more. Uh, it also has an effect on the private, private sector when the government can't be a dependable partner in maintaining a consistent level of programs and services. So what can we do? I want to tell you right now before we get any farther, the recommendation of the task force is not a sales tax. Most of you can exhale a sigh of relief. Uh, if you are among the 28% or so of Oregonians who are diehard, uh, believers in a sales tax, you can begin your grieving now, but that's not where we're going with these recommendations. Um, history tells us that that's not a viable option for the state, and so does current polling. So where can we go? Well, we began a journey toward this uh, actually in 2002 during the recession when we established a constitutional amendment to create the Education Stability Fund, funded by lottery dollars to support our kindergarten through university budget, uh, and that, that, that rainy day fund for education has grown now to $393 million. That was a good start, but the other half of the state budget was not supported, undergirded by a reserve fund in 2002, uh, and left it exposed to the, to, uh, uh, the same boom and bust cycle uh, as we've experienced in the past. In 2007, the legislature made a start on that side of the budget by creating the statutory rainy day fund, funding it with a one-time appropriation of the corporate kicker, uh, plus a promise uh, uh, to fund a, with a 1% uh, ending fund balance in future uh, biennia. Uh, and that, that fund now has a $340 million balance. So we have a good start, but the, the key finding and recommendation of the task force is that that's not enough. Not only are the dollars not enough in those rainy day funds, but the rainy day fund that the legislature created last session doesn't have an adequate ongoing funding stream to be a viable rainy day fund. So what do we do? Well, enter the biennial general fund forecast and the state income tax kicker. Briefly, as you know, biennially, the state economist forecasts the revenue for the next two years to a number, and the legislature adopts a budget pegged to that number. If the revenue comes in under that number, we look at uh, reductions in spending. If it comes in above that number, more than 2%, the income tax kicker kicks, and all of that excess revenue is reverted back to taxpayers. We know that it's impossible to predict with accuracy that general fund forecast. In fact, if there's one thing we can say with certainty about the forecast is that it will always be wrong. It's only a question from biennium to biennium, how wrong? And as I said, when it's wrong by more than 2%, every penny of excess revenue that has been collected during that biennium is paid back. Interesting timing that we've had in the last couple of uh, kicker scenarios, uh, a kicker that, that uh, kicked just before the 2001-2003 recession, and in our last scenario, uh, we kicked uh, $1.2 billion back uh, just before uh, starting into the current uh, decline that we're seeing right now, uh, which of course indicates uh, revenue that would have been but is not available to maintain programs and services. So the solution, as we are recommending to the, to the legislature, would be a constitutional amendment to uh, amend the kicker law so that we calculate not just a number for every biennium to budget to, but we calculate a margin of error. We can do that historically. We can look back over the years and calculate every two years how wrong has the kicker been over the average of the past 20 years. Call that the standard deviation. Our recommendation is that if, the, if revenue exceeds the forecast number that the state economist gives the legislature to budget to, 
but comes within that standard deviation, within that margin of error, that that money would be appropriated to the statutory rainy day fund, which we would elevate to constitutional status uh, with triggers that, are, that uh, only allow access to that fund uh, in demonstrable economic downturns. If revenue comes in over that standard deviation, the kicker will kick, and once the rainy day fund has been funded to a 10% level of the prior biennial budget, then we quit filling it and we revert to the current kicker law. So how would this work? Last, I mentioned that the last time the kicker kicked, it was $1.2 billion. If this methodology had been in place, uh, last time the kicker kicked, $800 million would have been deposited to the rainy day fund. $400 million still would have gone out in kicker refund. And that $800 million would have been available today to mitigate the downturn that we're seeing in programs and services due to uh, reduced uh, funding. The strategy here is simple. It is to use excess revenue in good times to save for the hard times that we know will come. These are inevitable cycles. We know they're coming. We just don't know when. This is not a new tax. And in fact, having a viable rainy day fund can avoid the need not only for cuts, but also uh, can mitigate uh, uh, the need for income tax or fee increases during a recession, which themselves can have uh, exa effects of exacerbating the recession. This proposal also does not grow government. Uh, adequacy, that is the size of government, is a debate that we can and should have. But our task force was not focused on the size. Our task force is focused on the structure. Whether you have a, a, a government this big or that big, large or small, dependability and stability over the long term uh, is a virtue in itself. And this methodology that we propose uh, will help bring that to a much greater degree than we have seen in Oregon. This is not a new concept, and touching back to the theme of the day on uh, uh, lessons uh, at home and abroad, uh, I think the first historical record of this concept was about three or 4,000 years ago uh, between Joseph and Pharaoh in Egypt, uh, when uh, Joseph uh, set aside the, uh, 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 the grain in the, in the granaries during the years of plenty, uh, so that there would be grain available during the lean years to come, and Joseph has been regarded ever since as a wise man, in fact, even divinely inspired uh, for, for his vision uh, of his, his very own first rainy day fund in history. So we have a start. Uh, the state has the structures in place for this rainy day fund, uh, but we don't have is adequate means of funding it on an ongoing basis, providing a sizable rainy day fund that when it is drawn on can refill uh, at a fast enough rate to be available for the next economic downturn. This proposal will get us there. Uh, we're a few thousand years late in coming to, uh, uh, coming to it, uh, but I would say better late than never, and I hope that uh, we can count on uh, members' uh, support to encourage the legislature uh, to move this forward to uh, adoption by the people of the state through a constitutional amendment in this coming session. Thank you very much. We just have a few minutes for questions. Our first question is, uh, is, is typical is from our uh, Board of Host uh, guest, uh, our <laughs> Board of Governors host, which is Ted Kay. Ted is our uh, treasurer. Thank you, Jim. This is a question for any of our speakers who will take it. Exactly 75 years ago in 1934, the City Club Bulletin urged early payment of property taxes to help with the current fiscal crisis. Exactly 50 years ago, in 1958, a major city club program presented principal ways to solve Oregon's tax and budgets problem, including excise, business, and sales taxes. Exactly 25 years ago, in 1984, the club's 96-page research report on Oregon's tax system recommended a major restructuring, including a broad-based retail sales tax. It seems we have known for a long time what the solutions are, but we as a state have trouble getting to them. How might things be different now? Um, 
you know, with, with due respect to the club, I would submit that uh, we don't know that the club hasn't found what the solutions are. Um, study after study um, has verified what Mr. Pazdina showed us, is that when we take money out of the private sector, we actually reduce revenues, and we reduce the creation of wealth. I think the, the lesson is just the opposite. How do we provide key government services while minimizing the um, money which is pulled out of the private sector? We're in a recession. We have to create wealth. And we don't um, create wealth most efficiently when we um, take it out of people's hands. Ted, if I, can just, if I can just jump in very quickly, and I know we don't want to all answer each, each of the questions, but uh, it does give me an opportunity to say that, uh, again, what I, what I did focus on was one recommendation of the task force, which can be found at www.leg.state.or.us, or use a search engine and enter Oregon legislature and find your way to the revenue committee. you find a copy of our report. Uh, one of the recommendations long term is that the state continue to engage voters in an ongoing dialogue of education and information uh, and examining the prospects even still of something in the nature of a consumption tax. Uh, so that may be out there in the future, but clearly voters are not ready to go there today. Our focus then became how can we make the system we have work better in the short term rather than reaching out for something like that retail sales tax and, and losing the opportunity uh, to get even something now. Others comment. Okay, we have question, uh, time for just one question. Please identify yourself as a club member. Hi, my name is Ethan Scarl. I'm a club member. Uh, I'm a lay person in economics. But it seems reasonable to me to to view tax cut as an investment in our economy and therefore to ask what is the return on investment. I have heard analysts speak to this and say that uh, tax cuts, that taxes are not as efficient a method of investing in the economy as well-directed spending programs. Um, and this would seem to indicate that, uh, that tax the taxes should be maintained or even raised and the money be well directed at, uh, at intelligent spending. And this, uh, I'm quite confused by this because it certainly flies in the face of what I seem to have heard today. I'd appreciate any comment. Yeah, if I might address that first. Uh, uh, there have been many empirical studies of what the effects of raising a tax rate is on the rate of growth of an economy. And all I can tell you is that the rate of return implicit in that calculus is very high for tax cuts across every class of tax, payroll tax, income tax, personal income tax, corporate income tax, sales tax, all of them have negative coefficients that suggest that as you raise them, the rate of growth of GDP, which is a measure of economic output, uh, as you raise those rates, uh, GDP goes down. Uh, this is uh, something that, uh, unfortunately, it's just, it's just hard to anticipate when, if you take a static view of the world, that there's all of you out there, you've got your wallets, they're a fixed size. If I can take 1% more out of your wallet, I must get more money, right? But the reality is you go home with feeling less wealthy, less inclined to work hard, less inclined to invest, more risk-averse, and at the end of the day, which may be a year or two later, things are worse. Okay, I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there. We've run out of time. Uh, please join us next week for a discussion of diversity in politics in America uh, with Willamette University President Lee Pelton. Uh, don't forget to buy your books for the January 28th Citizens Read, uh, now featuring a presentation and Q&A with author Stephen Wax available at the back of the room. Uh, as we close, please uh, help me express our appreciation to today's panelists, Rich Burke, Randy Pozdina, and Lane Shetterly. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>